Excellency, to welcome. And our speakers are there to my right. The, the reason why they're there is because we're going to be speaking a lot about the painting, so we, we wanted everyone to have an encumbered view of the painting. Today is International Day of Peace, so best wishes, everyone. Uh, this Day of Peace, as you know, was instituted by the UN General Assembly. Every year it's got a different uh, motto or, or tagline. And this year, it happens to be the right to peace, also because it is dedicated to the 70th of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We keep a lot of documents here. And let me tell you that the Declaration of Human Rights is the most translated document on the planet. I have with me three speakers who will talk about various things linked to the Day of Peace and the painting. I will introduce them in a minute. Let me tell you a little bit about, about the painting then. The painting got here in uh, the early stages of this building, who was, as you know, the, the headquarters of the League of Nations. It got here by train, and it was actually brought here by the painter. The painter had taken two years and a half to paint this painting, and I will quote him in a minute, because he had a very strong stance against war and violence. We have invited a world-renowned specialist of the painter. He will tell us more about that. But just to tell you that the painting has been here where you see it uh, st uh, uh, from December 39. And actually, Sorensen, the painter, had been in touch with the architects of the Palais des Nations as what was being uh, built. So to make sure that he would have a special location in the building, a niche. And this is where it's been put in 39. After spending a month and a half, or maybe two months, he was exposed, actually, was up, up uh, on an exhibition in Oslo. And then Sorensen himself, accompanied by his son, took the train through uh, Nazi Germany and ended up here in this building where he was put there. A lot of people refer to this as a fresco. This gives a number of us, especially my colleague, my colleague Clara, the goosebumps. It isn't. This is a painting. It's painted on canvas, and it has been then put on the wall there. So as I was saying, uh, Sorensen was a fierce um, uh, pacifist. I say fierce because he had an anger against violence and war. And actually, one of our speakers will, will tell you more because his master thesis was on the, on the anger of, uh, against war by Sorensen. And on the occasion of donating this painting, he said, he said, at the bottom, the misery that one should not seek to forget, the destroyed home, the human being with the gas mask, oppressed and ill. But at the same time, one should not let this weight you down. It expresses the childish Nordic belief that peace and justice will come nevertheless. As the world is today, so he's talking 39, right? As the world is today, it will destroy our belief that international difficulties can be solved in peace and understanding. He goes on and then he says, we believe that the world will move upwards towards the light and forward to the eternal peace, which is up there, he's describing his own painting. And then he concluded by saying, I will not give up. I love humankind. They are just lost in a dark and stormy night. I think that it would be difficult to be more concise than the painter himself. You, you see here through his words that he was half painter and half writer because he can conceptualize to the United Nations here in Geneva. Ambassador, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pisano, and it's very nice to see so many of you here uh, on uh, this uh, important day. And I just want to start by pos posing a question, and that is, can art make a difference in the face of harsh and difficult realities, conflict and war? Can art in all, our for all its forms have a role in building sustainable peace? I think that maybe I will get many different answers from you if I posed it to you, but there was at least one Norwegian who would have answered an enthusiastic yes uh, to these questions, even as he saw the world leading towards a terrible conflict in the autumn of 1939. And his name was, of course, Henrik Sørensen. Not only 
was he, as we have heard, a staunch believer in pacifism and the role an artist can play in the wider society. He spoke of a northern light and Nordic way to peace that he suggested could overcome conflict and war. I'm very glad that we have a distinguished art historian uh, with us uh, this afternoon, Mr. Svein Olof Hoff, who will say more about these things and give us a deeper insight into Sørensen's vision and his artistic methods. On my part, as a representative of Norway, I would like to highlight that in many ways Sørensen maybe foresaw and maybe even inspired Norway's engagement in peace diplomacy and conflict resolution that we have seen emerged after the Second World War. My country continues to be engaged in peace processes and to lead efforts to promote reconciliation in many countries and many parts of the world. And our role and approach has, of course, changed and varied over the, over the years, but some features of Norway's engagement has, have been consistent. They include good relations with key international actors. We are a genuine United Nations champion, a major contributor and strong supporter of the multilateral architecture. And this is very important at a time when we see this system uh, under uh, duress and stress. So we will continue to be a UN champion. Norway is willing to broadly engage with many parties to a conflict, and we enjoy close cooperation with civil society. We insist that women participate at the negotiating table and in the broader peace processes. This is absolutely essential to resolve conflicts and create lasting solutions. We provide development assistance and we support peace efforts based on the, on the spirit of solidarity and we have a long-term perspective in our work. This is something that has been maintained by many or several successive Norwegian governments and this is one of our strengths, the ability to be in for the long haul. Peace and reconciliation certainly does require this long-term perspective. It takes a lot of patience, and we may not always succeed, but we continue to believe in the dictum of the Norwegian victim, diplomat and humanitarian Fritjof Nansen, who insisted, the difficult is what takes a little time, the impossible is what takes a little longer. Many of the global threats we face today are symptoms of unresolved political issues. In our efforts to address the causes, not just relieve the symptoms, we need everybody on board from politicians to artists. It's therefore a particular pleasure for me to co-host this event in which we focus on one of Norway's artistic contributions, the 56 square meters behind me, marked, as we have said, with the Nordic light and with the women of the five continents at the very top. The mural encourages states to join forces to find durable solutions through multilateral peaceful means, a message benefiting the League of Nations almost a century ago, and a message that is as relevant to the United Nations and the world today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And so we have brought here two speakers because they're both of them linked very much to the painting and the painter. I'm going to introduce them, women's first. So we have with us today Toril Skard. Toril is, um, um, it's difficult to introduce her because she has a CV on, on three pages, but let me summarize by saying that, well, first of all, uh, she's a psychologist and researcher from Norway who has had this distinguished careers in both the UN and in Norway. Uh, in her CV, what strikes me is that there are words that appear constantly. It's first, first woman, first woman director, first woman secretary, etc. And also the words women's rights uh, are there a lot. And so she dedicated her career to women's rights and to leading also, she was active even in development cooperation. She was a high ranking official in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. And she is also the author of many, many books. And so is our second speaker, uh, Professor Svein Olaf Hoff, who is also the director of the Art Museum in, in, uh, in Oslo. 
and he has a master degree, he's, writ he's wrote a master degree on angst and violence in Emrick Sorensen's art. So he's perfectly uh, uh, familiar with our painter here, the author, the author of our painter. As, as I said, uh, he's the director, sorry, I made a mistake, you're the director of the Lillehammer Art Museum. I, I, I apologize for that. And he's also a figure in, Nord, in Norwegian uh, culture, and as I said before, has written several books. And actually, we will begin with him, and he will tell us a little bit uh, with some uh, uh, visual aid, we will, will tell us about the history of the painting, but also of art in general. Start with that one. Put my glass there. Ambassador, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here, standing here, seeing this painting for the first time in my life. Um, when I was writing my thesis, I wrote down to the UN and asked if I could come and see it, and they said, it's behind a curtain and it's, it's no one there and it's so difficult to get in. So, so we might get you in, but, but uh, perhaps next year and things like that. So I never seen it before and now here I am and it's so good to see it. And it's, it's a very, very nice painting uh, and I'm quite impressed. So that's, that's very nice to be here. I've written a little bit here. Let's see, with all my manuscripts. I won't keep you long. Um, uh, we have scheduled time, but I would say Henrik Sörensen, he was born in 1882 and died 80 years later in 1962. He was a general figure in Scandinavian cultural life for several generations. As an artist, he made an impact on the average man and woman that was in many way greater and more fundamental than the master painters in Norway, Christian Krog and Erik Wernschold. He was considered, for example, among those with a general interest in culture at the time, far, far more popular and recognized than, for example, Edvard Munch. Henrik Sörensen was a Renaissance person with a vast knowledge in a number of areas and with an enormous need to distinguish himself. He posed a characteristic nature and held a number of posts. He was a public figure for 50 years, achieving recognition of a national status early in his career. He burned with a thought of enlightenment for the people and consciously used his position to influence his surroundings. In addition to his work as an artist, he wrote newspaper articles, he gave lectures, he fought for causes he had strong interest in. He interfered in a number of circumstances. He was a good speaker and in his prime impressed those of like, as, like mine as well as his enemies. Sörensen was a pacifist and his work for peace was particularly important to him. At time, he was so engaged with social issues that it interfered with his work as an artist. As with other forceful personalities holding strong opinions and broad influence in small milieus, Henrik Sörensen was a controversial figure. He was a good friend of his friend and used a great deal of his time, influence and organizational skills to help others, particularly artists that he believed in. This created envy and conflict. Those who did not receive support or felt resistance and opposition saw Sörensen as a clear exponent of what they considered for the power, even the abuse of power of the Norwegian Matisse pupils. In retrospect, we can say that even if Sörensen wielded significant influence, his evaluations proved to be surprisingly correct. And here we can see him uh, in his prime time uh, in 1925 
self-portrait belongs to Gothenburg Art Museum, uh, and, and this is a man who knows what he wants, and he knows how to get it, as the song says. Here comes another one. It's not coming here. Yeah, there, but not here. That one, okay. He was born across the border in Sweden with his, where his father ran a lumber and sawmill factory, and he started early to draw. And he was not a very good artist uh, at the beginning. Uh, but being born in Sweden, of Norwegian parents, uh, he held the thing that happened in 1905 when Norway and Sweden broke up, and a lot of Norwegian left wings would like to go to the front uh, with guns and and go to war towards Sweden. They negotiated things, and he always went back to that episode and said that if people can sit down, talk together, we can solve things uh, friendly without war, without fighting, without killing. And he always came back to that. Which one here? No, it's not coming there. Yeah, there it's coming. Perhaps you can put that. Uh, he was very ambitious and took himself and his work very seriously. And we can see that in this drawing uh, in, from 1903. And the next one. There. there. Uh, he was early interested in Swedish history. This is a lyric from a traditional folk song from the area where he was born. And the Swedish Nobel Prize winner, Selma Lagerlöf wrote her books from the same area. And here it says in, in Swedish, till Österland vil jeg fara så snabbt som den susande vind over berg og djupe daler, alt under så grønan en vind. Oh, and, and just being a Norwegian, born in Sweden, uh, being not Norwegian, not Swedish, but both, he, he thought that people should live together uh, despite of color, despite of religion, and being friends. This is his first painting. Is it coming up? No, it's coming up. This is his first painting on the autumn exhibition. Uh, it's called The Cripple. It's, it's the man to the left here. Uh, it had reference to the man who cut off his hand at the sawmill of his father. Uh, and at that time, he worked as a law clerk, uh, and the sketches, the drawings on the side, uh, they they drawn from on the lawyer's paper, and it's he is feeling sorry for the man, and it's painted, it's made that we should feel sorry for him. He has no job anymore, no work, no money, uh, because of an accident. In 1906, he went to Paris for the first time, uh, here with friends and colleagues Severin Grande. Sørensen is a tall man, very thin. He saw the famous sculpturalist Auguste Rodin in Pantheon, uh, which made impression. And, and this is taken with Sørensen's small camera. It's huge, it's a very, very small, small photography. Uh, and uh, uh, he was impressed seeing Rodin. Early interest in dramatic scenes. This symbolism of death aiming for the peasant working bad crops. The death is coming, it's coming. Still confident. Here with his wife to be, Gudrun Kleve, he was very seriously as an artist. But he was a joker. He did practical joke, he laughed, he was uh, his friend's friend, uh, and he had a good time with friends, but he, he when it came to art, it was very, very seriously. Uh, Despite what his best friend, the Swedish painter Birgit Simonsson, unfortunately, totally forgotten today, this is painting by the Norwegian painter Einar Sandberg. And this is not painted, they are in the early 20s. This is not painter that parties and drinks and, and having fun. This is serious people who make art, and art is part of an important thing for a country. Here with friends uh, in Lillehammer, painter friends, on a mountain trip. First new ram romantic masterpiece, Summer Night uh, from Oscar Wilde. Staying in a small timber cabin without a stove, very thin. 
here again with his friend Bigge Simonsson. Back in Paris as a Matisse student in 1909. Work as a Matisse student, I said. I have to look at my papers here. There it is. The key Norwegian student of Matisse, Henrik Sørensen, Sjang Heiberg, Axel Leverdam, P. Krog, laid the foundation for the artistic success in Paris in the period 1908 to 10. In addition to their own considerable artistry, Heiberg, Krog and Leverdam would come to influence young Norwegian artists for a period for over 40 years through their act of teaching at the National Academy of Art in Oslo. Sørensen turned out to be a well-known person among society's leaders in many, many fields. Portrait of an older woman. As a clerk, he read about the mass murder Svartbekken. He was the last person who was educated, educated in peacetime in Norway in 1876. There were 25 people executed ex ooh, uh, uh, in, in Norway after the war, 25, but this is, was the last in peacetime, 1876. And here is a, here's the mass mother sitting, having coffee uh, with a fireplace. Uh, no, that was wrong way. Nine years later, he prepares his first real masterpiece, Svartbekken. Uh, yeah, okay, one more, one more. Yeah. Um, uh, Svartbekken, uh, this is the first painting of expressionism. Svartbekken is here afraid and scared. Face has clear similarities with monk's scream uh, and he's sitting uh, on a mountain covered with blood and covered with his own sin. He's thinking about what he's done. This is not a brutal mass murder. This is a scared, frightened man uh, that thinks over uh, what had happened in his life. Pantheistic and frightened landscape, just like this. National painting in Norway, Telemark. Five years after the dissolvement of the union with Sweden, uh, he was painting the independent Norway. He went to, to Telemark, which was supposed to be the most Norwegian that you can find all over the world, especially in Norway. Uh, there's where um, the Vikings were, there's where uh, Erik Wernshall found uh, his uh, characters for Snorre, uh, the national epic of Norway, and Sørensen was painting Telemark. He has discovered Van Gogh, for example, you can see. Among early masterpieces, very modernistic woman painting in Fandongen style in Paris. Uh, this was exhibited in Stockholm in, in Sweden in 1910. Got terrible critics uh, and uh, it was supposed to close down the whole exhibition. Then the Swedish painter prince, Prince Hauschen, came and bought the paintings. And you know, Swedish people are even more interested in the King House than Norway. So, uh, that turned this out to be a very successful. Here we can see models, city scenes, interested in works of author Adam Edgar Allan Poe. During the first wall, he made a series of lithographic printed once a week in the Norwegian painter, paint in Norwegian paper, Vadet Nuskang. And now I'm looking at my papers again. Uh, I think we go one more. Here, for example, this is called Against the War. Uh, uh, it says underneath, a hero's uh, entrance to heaven. And we can see the angel is coming with a wheelbarrow with dead people. That's, much, that's not very erotic at all. And so, so this is a very simple way of saying that this is stupid. Uh, heroism, fighting for the country, it's stupid. Um, uh, the pacifist and social debater Sørensen would come to tackle the war's meaninglessness through his art. He painted, um, he painted bombed cities and widows after shipwrecks. In December 1917, he gave lithographic account with short comments in, in Verdensgang, such as Souvenir du Sali, this one. Um, 
where dead cows and a dead soldier lie in a bombed out city street. Sully was an idyllic little town outside Paris that some of the Matisse students had traveled to in 1910 and painted from. And now it's just this. Against war and revolution. War and revolution made in 1915, not just war. Youngsters scared of the violence of the war here, holding hands in the woods. At the same time, paintings of modernistic, modernistic nudes melancholic paintings of his wife, keeping my time, Photo photography of the married couple in 1920. They went back to Paris in 1920. Cezanne's Mountain in Provence. Sørensen met the Swedish writer Per Lagerqvist, whom he became good friends with. Lagerqvist received the Nobel Prize in Literature later on in the early 1950s. Um, Lagerqvist wrote a lot against the fascism uh, during his time as an author. And he is known for this, this famous poem. There's a lot of Norwegians here. It's called Det vakreste når det fymmer, og all den kjærlige himmelen rymmer ligger samlet at det er et dunkelt ljus over jorden og over verdens hus. Og alt er ømhet, alt er smekt av hender, og herrene feller ut plånene og fjerrene strender, og alt er nære, og alt er langt ifra og alt er evigt menneske fram som lå. Alt er med gitt, og alt skal tages fra meg. Innom kort skal allting tages fra meg. Molden, jorden, vegen der jeg går, og jeg skal vandre, og jeg skal vandre ensam utan spår. So this is a poet that, uh, and a painter uh, that copes with the real questions of life uh, in their art. In Paris he also painted his Inferno, a version of uh, Gustav Wigeland's uh, and Rodin's Referno, reference uh, to the World War, but of course also Dante in, in the background here with the Inferno. Uh, and he worked on this vision for, for years, a lot of sketches, same as he did with, uh, with this painting, uh, and very nice uh, sketches. Uh, uh, smaller paintings that's very independent. Uh, but this is again, after the war, it, it's, it's hell, it's inferno. People are there, they're crying, they're, uh, everything is falling apart, and it's just, just terrible. Study to inferno, new religious paintings, Pietà here, uh, Maria with the dead Christ, in 1923-24, he went uh, with his friend General Consul Peter Krag in Paris and sculpturist Sigrid Velhaven, they were at that time married, uh, to uh, Egypt, uh, to Cairo, and they were the first non-archaeologic travelers that visited uh, Tutankhamun's and Nefertiti's crypt. Uh, and Sørensen was very, very interested in Tutankhamun. He was the first non-violent pharaoh uh, and uh, the first person uh, in history that, that was uh, talking about the, the peace for thousands of years. Uh, but here they went, fantastic photography, they went to, to, to Paris, uh, to, to, to Egypt. Uh, he started back in Oslo to make uh, his first, second, uh, or at least one of the most important uh, uh, anti-war uh, paintings called Gatekamp in Oslo, dead pre persons in the street and a woman in despair. It's the rifle, Krag Jørgensen, uh, people's dead uh, inside here, a car crashed, and, and she's, she's very frightened and she's in despair. Here's a photograph of the model, Birgit Preste, posing for Gatekamp. Uh, Arends Mark, the fields of honor. The soldier on the both sides uh, here has the same uniform. So it's not the violence and the meaningless killing are the primary focus for Sørensen, not the defeat of the soldiers from Germany. Uh, and, and he uh, made this painting after reading Erik Maria Remark's book in Western Nishnoyes. Uh, uh, and he was very, very 
interested in that book. I have the copy at home with written. Henrik Sørensen wrote on every page what he thought about what he was reading. So it's interesting. Sketch drawing for the painting. Um, in 1930, Sørensen made a several search, uh, church decorations. They was always the forgiving Christ with hands out saying, let the young children come to me, all of you that suffers. It's not the frightening Christ. It's not the Christ that said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, then you go to hell. This is the man who says, come to me. Uh, uh, and uh, that was something different. And he made several very good church decorations in the 1930s. Here with his son to Geneva, uh, to the decoration of Folkeforbundet that we can see here today. Um, it was in 1939 when the Second World War just had begun. And here's the young son, he was born in 1920. Uh, so he was uh, 19 years old, uh, helping his father, as you said earlier, going through uh, Germany, uh, where no lights outside. They used, I think, almost three weeks with a train just to get here. Uh, and uh, here we can see the result. And home in Oslo, he was in his prime now. He was decorated the city hall. Um, I don't think that is the best thing he's done, but it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, uh, an aging Sörensen, uh, he never quit discussing what he was interested in. And there was always uh, the peace issue. Um, this painting is called The Jews and was influenced by the deportation of the Jews in Oslo to Germany, for example. And you can see it's a small painting, and they're so frightened, they're so scared. Sörensen stayed in a small place in Norway called Holmsbu in the summertime, a huge oak nearby that he despised as the griefing tree. During the war, even the trees felt sorrow. Sörensen was strong in his pacifism all through his life. This is one of the last known pictures of him in the studio, and again with the forgiving Christ in the background, standing there. Um, so, it's very nice to be here, to see the painting. I'm not finding my last... It's not here. It's uh, that's okay. Uh, it's it's um, it's again uh, the small, the suffering people on the bottom. It's climbing on uh, on top uh, to a better society. Knowledge is good. Uh, it's good to to uh, uh, get up to the top. And we have the four women for the four, fourth part of the world with their children and their uh, uh, on the top there. He had to have this uh, this uh, um, Norwegian Danish painter Jörg Jakobsen to help with the uh, with the construction of the pyramid, and that was done very well. And uh, again, it's. The suffering, it's a war on the side, it's the small child behind me here that's crying. Uh, and here's the war, the masks, the, the gas bombing, and a frightened people who through knowledge, through education, is coming their way on to the top, to the very top. Uh, do you take all these <laughs> stupid things? Uh, this painting were exhibited uh, in, in Oslo in Kunstnerhus Hus before it went there. Um, and uh, he was interviewed in one of uh, the Norwegian papers uh, and uh, uh, he said, I'm re in reality, I worked with Inferno, the Inferno motive all my life. I started in Copenhagen when I was 18 and sort of kept on with it used it one last time and broken free of it. It's the mud, the shit up on the legs, our mystery. 
That's why there's something magnif magnificent about seeing it for the last time, knowing that it's replaced by the city hall painting. That will become the exact opposite. I stood and painted and painted about peace and hope and humans. I was in the middle of the painting and in the middle of the upcoming world peace where I believed we were, but then we received telegrams about the war. I thought we felt down among the unhappy in the gutter again. It suddenly became so meaningless. I painted several sick flowers that day and I thought that an artist's life became meaningless. I believe it is the first time I've had this sensation. But it didn't last more than one day. And I can greet and tell them, me, you can torture a lifetime. But the last thing in me that will die is the hope. And now we can see the painting. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Hoff, for, for this uh, wonderful uh, journey you took us to. Thank you, Anne, also for your unwearing assistance and for wearing the same colors more or less than the painting. Um, I think that everyone here will never look at this painting again in the same way. So you really took us through it. I will also remember that uh, Norway abolished uh, the death penalty so long ago that you can't pronounce the word execution. Congratulations. <laughs> and then when Norwegians come to Geneva in December, do not need to wear a coat. I saw in the photo, very interesting. So thank you so much. Now let's continue our excursion into the life and art of uh, the painter Sorensen with Toris Karl. You came several times to our library. You found it open and welcoming differently from what it was said to you so many years ago. I don't know, what, can I ask, when was that? When did you try to come and see it? We'll take care of that. <laughs> we'll look into that very seriously. I thought it would be in the 60s during the peak of the Cold War. We'll, we'll look into that. And, and I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll keep you posted on what happened then. But you came to us several times and you found a different ambience, so much so that we started working together on this painting. So I'll let you tell the rest of the story, maybe. So please, come here. Do you have visuals as well? Okay, so please, please have coffee, please. The minister of Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, who gave this large mural to the League of Nations in 1939, he was my grandfather. Harald Dankut, he was the father of my mother. And after the Second World War, we lived with my grandmother, my parents, my brothers and sisters in a great bungalow near Oslo. And here in the living room, there was a large painting hanging on the wall with the inscription for the dream of peace. I was fascinated by it. In brown and rust red colors, it depicted a naked man climbing up a steep hill. And he was, oh, so tired. But he kept on climbing, nevertheless. How far it was to reach his goal, I had no idea but I was sure that he would not give up. And there were some light green spots at the top of the picture, which gave a vague idea of hope. I was not preoccupied with the large mural in Geneva, though my grandfather told me about it. To me, the painting was so complete that I could not think of it as only a detail in a larger work of art. And the painting at home gave me courage and strength. When I was mobbed at school, when I met resistance against what I thought or what I wanted to do, I would go home 
and I would look at the painting. I'd find comfort. A man had a dream of peace, and he just did not give up. Henrik Sternsen gave the painting to my grandfather with thanks. It's written in the corner to the left. Because of the role my grandfather played in assigning him the task of making the mural. Sternsen had contacts, as you've heard, in wide circles across the political spectrum and knew both the, the, form, the leading conservative politician, C.J. Hambro, and my grandfather, who was a leading labor politician, Haldan Kut, very well. And during my childhood, Sernsen often came home to us to see my grandfather. The whole family would have dinner together. Sernsen, or Cern as we called him, enjoyed being with children, and we looked forward to his visits. He was often dressed informally with his hair in a bit of a disarray. He came smiling, stretching his arms towards us, we joked and called him the gentle troll. And he played with us, friendly and warm-hearted, making sure we didn't quarrel and fight, and always supporting the weakest. I particularly remember once when I was 12 or 13 years old, and I was helping to prepare the dinner. I was going to serve a beer that I brewed myself, and I, I suggested that maybe we could have some beer with the meal. But my brothers and sisters immediately said, no, 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 that, that beer is not good. We can't drink that beer. It's not, it's not successful. When Henry Kernson heard this, he said, excuse me, but I would like a glass of that beer. And my brothers and sisters protested, no, 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 we can't give a guest that beer. But Sorensen took it, and he got a glass of the beer, and he tasted it. And he tasted it again, and was not a sound. And then he said, I think it's the best beer I've ever tasted. <laughs> I'll never forget it. And Sorens was also an absorbing artist, with such a varied, as he's shown, a collection of works, from portraits and landscapes to religious and political subjects, our family would often go around in Oslo and in the, our surroundings of Oslo and see the paintings. I would never be, get tired of going and looking at them and studying them and feeling the strength and comfort that it gave me. And to me, the decision of the Norwegian state to give the League of Nations a large mural by Henrik Sørensen was a good example of collaboration in spite of political differences. When the League was created after World War I, it was no simple matter for Norway. In fact, we joined the organization with 100 votes for and 20 against in Parliament. The Labour Party was against because the League was not based on disarmament. Four members of Parliament of the right also voted against because the organization was part of the Treaty of Versailles, which they thought was an immoral peace alliance. The opposition to the right was headed by the conservative C.J. Hombro. Hombro, and his the portrait of him standing there, was one of the most important politicians in Norway at the time. He became leader of the Foreign Policy Committee in Parliament, and during several international negotiations, he collaborated closely with my grandfather, although my grandfather was a member of the Labour Party. My grandfather was professor of history at the university, he did extensive research naturally and internationally and spoke many languages. Once Norwegian membership in the League of Nations was adopted in a reality, Hombro decided to use all his energy to make the work of the League as effective as possible. And my grandfather, the same approach when he became Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Labour government in 1935. So they continued to collaborate across party lines. As I grew up, I also became involved, as you've heard, in international cooperation and often visit UN offices, among others, here in Geneva. But I was always busy with different kinds of matters, and I didn't think of the CERN's mural before suddenly one day in 2014, when there was a kind of 100 years after the First World War, a very expert Norwegian historian gave a lecture in Oslo about the dream of peace. 
And to my surprise, she ended her lecture by stating that photos of the painting unfortunately only existed in black and white. And in fact, she didn't know if the mural even existed. Oh no, that wasn't possible. I lost my breath. How could an art experts in Norway not know what happened to a masterpiece of one of our greatest artists? Next time I went to Geneva, I was determined to find out. But I went to the, when the, the office of the tourist guides in Palais de Nation. No, they shook their heads. I'd never heard of a painting. And I said, yes, I want to see the painting. And so they asked some elderly colleagues. They got some books. And they found it. And when I insisted, they said, yes, 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 it, it is here. It, actually, it's in the library. And I asked, can I see it? Oh, yes, but you see, we don't have it on the ordinary guided tour because people running around all the time in the library would disturb the work. And the painter also said that it should be a room which was suited for meditation. So that's why it's not in the ordinary tourist tour. So I went to the library, and there, when I went, came to the entry, they said, oh, no problem. And I was immediately taken to this room. There was the mural completely intact and much larger than I had ever expected. So many human beings striving and struggling, oppressed men and unhappy women. The man on my painting at home nearly disappeared near the bottom of the mass of people. At the top of the pyramid, there was light and peace with mothers and children from various continents the despair and the hope. It was so overwhelming and touching that tears came to my eyes. My guide was a very friendly, sympathetic French gentleman. And when he saw that I started crying, he, he be, immediately became very sympathetic. Madame, vous êtes de mieux. And I told him about Henrik Sørensen and the painting I had at home and why this touched me so. And he listened very intentively, and then he burst out. You've known Henrik Sørensen? How wonderful! His painting gives us the vision for our efforts here at the UN. But information about the work has been lost. We don't even, we're not even sure if it is completed. The lack of knowledge, both in Oslo and in Geneva, about such a wonderful, important work of art, shocked me. So that was when our collaboration started. I started searching, acquiring and spreading information in collaboration with Henrik Sørensen's only son, as you've seen, Sven Olaf Sørensen, who was still alive at the time. Unfortunately, he died recently at a very advanced age. Sven Olaf was a very respected professor of physics and he made great efforts to promote his father's art. He, among others, established the two Henrik Sørensen museums we have, and one of them has already, two of, them, two of them have been mentioned, and he wrote a biography of his father. St. Ulf was also assisted by a number of friends, among some are here today. I worked with them with great pleasure, and I worked with the Norwegian mission in Geneva with great pleasure, I worked with the staff at the UN Library. I found and read the biographies of Henrik Sørensen, written by our speaker here today, Sven Olaf Hoff, in addition to Henrik Sørensen's son, Sven Olaf Sørensen. And I've translated the relevant text about the dream of peace from Norwegian into English. And then I translated into Norwegian from two six books that I received here in the library about the art in Palais de Nation. I'm very happy and moved and proud of the international collaboration we have had. Partners both in Oslo and in Geneva have actively followed up. A photo of the dream of peace is now exhibited in the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, where everybody in Oslo can go and see it. And here we are in the Palais de Nation, the International Day of Peace, to appreciate the contribution of Henrik Sørensen's efforts to peace. 
So I just say thank you, thank you, thank you, and I hope now many people will be inspired by the painting and contribute to collective efforts for peace. Thank you. Now you know why no one can beat Nordics as storytelling. <laughs> it's really with you, it's in your genes. Thank you so much. This is a true story, ladies and gentlemen. It's exactly as it happened. And the guide that guided Toril to this painting, where indeed she started crying, and we can now understand why, uh, works next door just to us, is one of our library clerks. He's on leave this week, so he's enjoying a holiday. Uh, but we have his testimonials, we, we captured it on video, so if one day you want to see that, we'll send it to you. We captured that moment, rendered through his, um, his souvenir, because he didn't know who Toril was. And Toril went on to actually suggest something else, to really attach her role and her name to the history of this painting. She asked for permission to make a present, and the present is that plaque that you see over there, because this painting has never had a clear identification of artist and donation. The donation comes from Norway, which gives the informal name to this room that we call about, among ourselves and our customers the Norwegian room. And that has been designed and produced by Torild, shipped over to Geneva, and put on that wall, except it's got four screws, except they're not tightened. And so with the four of us now, we'll go over there with a screwdriver and screw it in for as long as history of this organization will last. So would you please accompany me and do this and so that we can have a photo of that while we do it and concerning to history.